So uh, we're going to do the show of hands thing. How many people in here are designers? I, I'm not going to test you on that, so um, <laughs> don't be too scared. How many in here would consider themselves a developer? OK. Uh, do we have anybody else? Do we have management who would not consider themselves either? OK, we got a handful of those. Anything else? That pretty much covers it, right? We got a couple seats up here, guys, if you want to come down. We got some people who have scooted in, so there's even chairs on the edge. You don't have to crawl over awkwardly or anything. Uh, so quickly about me, um, I was the lead designer on Brackets, which was a fun open source, uh, is still, a uh, fun open source editor. Are you a Brackets user? Yeah, there's always like three. Yeah. Um, so it's an open source editor uh, built in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, for building web applications. That's what it's designed for. It's got some really fun stuff in it, some innovative ideas. And the team that I was able to work with at Adobe on building that, they're brilliant. Um, some of the smartest people I've ever worked with. So that was fun. Um, I was also a, a developer on Topcoat, um, and I'm still working on that one. It's a CSS framework, because we don't have enough of those. Um, so yeah. And then uh, right now, I'm actually the front end lead for PhoneGap, which is not an open source project, but is built on Cordova. And the team is active participants in Cordova, so that we kind of get an open source uh, ticket that way. We, I, we're running out of seats, guys. We've got a couple down here in front. We've got a couple back there. And uh, apparently, they're recording it. So if you have to leave, I won't harm you or anything. All right. So um, originally, I was a designer. Uh, I moved um, into coding for a few reasons, uh, mostly because I like coding, uh, but also I realized I could make more money, which is a sad fact. Um, developers make more money than designers, for the most part. That's just a generalization, and it's sad, but it's oftentimes true. Um, and then also, I also had a hard time. I was not a good designer. I had a hard time working with developers sometimes, because they'd be like, oh, we can't do that. And I'd be like, screw you. And then I'd go and find a way to do it, right? That's not necessarily great communication or collaboration. That's not necessarily a good designer. It's a very junior designer type of move, which I did all the time. Um, so I found myself coding more and more. And then uh, I started with brackets. Turns out I've also worked on Adobe Flex, which, was before, which is now Apache Flex. Um, so I've kind of worked on open source projects for a long time, but it wasn't until Topcoat and uh, PhoneGap that I actually understood what real open source was. Uh, so I was doing some pseudo open source. Adobe would do things like uh, they'd take down the code base for a few days before a big release uh, because they didn't want anyone to know what was coming. Uh, that's not really open, right? And then they uh, stopped being able to handle um, bug fixes because there was too many coming in. So they're just like, yeah, we're not doing that. Any that's not open. So they, there were some growing pains there, and it's in a lot better place now. Um, but because of some of the mistakes that I made, I actually helped start something called the Open Design Foundation. Um, and it's a small little thing, but it's just trying to help encourage more designers to get involved in open source. It's really the end goal. Uh, there's actually some stickers out on the sticker exchange if you want them, because, yeah, oh, nice. Already got one on there. Thank you. Um, but yeah, we want to get more designers involved in open source. And uh, where we can, we'd like to help developers to understand design better uh, in open source. So I'm going to talk about three things real quick. We're going to talk about the big picture stuff, um, which is the current state of open, uh, design in open source right now, um, and how we need to change things. And then I want to talk about some more specific discussions of best practices uh, for working with designers in your current projects, and then how we can bridge the gap between what we have and what we need um, in the future going forward. So how can design help open source? Uh, there are three main areas that we really could use design help. Uh, user experience is the biggest one, um, and somewhat because it encompasses everything else. You could say that everything, every time a user interacts with your project on any level, it is considered user experience. Okay, That's kind of a vague, blobbish term than when we use it like that. But that's how some people do use it. Uh, branding. I'm going through this right now. A project was just given like a cease and desist type of thing. And they're like, oh, crap, we've got to rename our project. And you would not believe like the thought process that's going through the project right now. Like, we're just grasping at straws sometimes. We're like, all right, what if we turn it upside down? What does it look like then, right? Like, it's not necessarily 
like a process. It's just kind of throwing stuff and seeing what's going to stick. Um, branding is important, and there is a process to it if you want to do it. Uh, and then, obviously, the visual UI. When we think about design, that's oftentimes what we come to. That's what we think of. We think, oh, this is pretty. This is whatever the other terrible words that we use are, like sexy. Uh, oh, or like it's smooth, it's butter. I hate all this stuff. All right, so <laughs> stuff that um, usually is just what we're looking at. And that visual UI really is the least important out of the three. Uh, it is important, don't get me wrong. But if I had to pick one, I'd stick with user experience, and as a second, maybe branding. Uh, so some examples of projects uh, I just want to point out real quickly. Um, SAS is amazing. Uh, it is, it's fantastic, right? And it's got a beautiful logo. It's got excellent documentation. Who in here loves SAS? Right? Lots of people. The community is really inclusive. They're doing a great job. Anybody in here loving SAS? Uh, less? Sorry? We got less people, OK? Less for less. Um, part of it, a little bit, is I feel like they're missing a little bit of the design. There's a little bit less documentation, and that it's kind of a chicken and the egg type of problem, right? If you get enough people, someone's going to start writing more documentation. Um, so the more popular projects tend to get better documentation, but if you have better documentation, you tend to get more popular. So it's kind of a chicken and the egg. And then anyone in here love Stylus? Yeah, that's my people right there. All right, so it's a really lesser known used project right now. Uh, I really, really, really enjoy the syntax, but it's highly polarizing. Um, and it does not have an amazing logo. Um, I don't know what that thing is or what it's doing. Uh, nothing wrong with it, but compared to what I feel like SAS is communicating, I just don't feel like it's quite as strong. Um, and the point of this talk is not to tear down projects. I'm not trying to tear down. If the stylist designer is in here who designed this logo, I love you. Thank you for your contribution. Um, but we're not done. Um, so what is the current state of design contributions in open source? Um, right now, uh, open source design, it's, it's a lot less commonplace. And there are a couple reasons for that. Um, the first is. I, well, the first is I think we lack tooling uh, around design. When you're a developer, you have all of these really nice tools that developers have built for themselves to improve collaboration, right? We don't have the GitHub for design. Pixel Apps tried using that tagline for a while, um, and it, it's probably closer, but I'm not forking and merging designs anytime soon. Like, that's not happening, um, unless I'm copying and pasting layers from Photoshop documents. Um, so tooling's just not there. But I think that's a weak excuse. Because to be honest, tooling hasn't always been there for developers either. Like This is pretty recent stuff that we're dealing with good collaboration tools. Uh, I think the bigger problem and the harder one is one that deals with culture. Um, design hasn't had the people like Richard Stallman or uh, Linus Torvalds who will be pushing uh, open source and this collaboration. I think on top of that, design school, uh, design schools, and managers um, in the workforce, they encourage competition. Designers are encouraged to compete with each other. Um, on top of that, designers are often overworked and underappreciated. So you have a designer who is on three projects at work and has to switch tracks all the time between these projects. As soon as they get home, they're not going to be excited about contributing to a fourth project in their free time. Um, and th those things aren't exclusive to designers, but I feel like those problems are worse with designers than they are with developers. Um, yeah, I, when I worked at, in the agencies, almost all, all the agencies that I've been a part of that were serious about development, they were, the de designers were outnumbered at least like four or five to one, at least. Um, and you'd have like a small core team of designers who are working on everything and not really doing any of them perfectly. They're just kind of trying to tread water on all the projects at the same time. But uh, we do have some designers already involved in open source, and we appreciate those contributions that we do get, uh, what other, whatever format we can get them. Uh, but it usually falls into one of three camps. Uh, the first one is usually the designer. That's the buddy of an open source project owner who is tricked or <laughs> cajoled and somehow pressured, peer pressure, right? For a positive use, hopefully, but usually 
they're peer pressured into doing something that they wouldn't have otherwise done. Uh, there's the other one who is the uh, designer who's a corporate sponsor. Um, usually they are a paid employee of a, of a company that wants to uh, contribute to an open source project or a company that owns an open source project. Um, anybody in that camp in here? Okay. They're getting paid to do open source work, and that's great, and I don't think we should lose that at all. Um, and then the third one is the designer who happens to also be a developer. So a developer who is already invested or interested in open source, and they realize, hey, this design work's not getting done, someone better do it, I'm the only one who has the skill here to do it, I might as well do it until we find someone better, okay? So those hybrid people. Um, which is great. Anybody else feel like there's anybody outside of those realms? Is there any designer who doesn't fall into those camps? Okay, I think this is, this is pretty accurate. There are other talented designers who are making contributions to other projects, but that aren't specifically open source. Um, and I think it might happen on open source once in a while, but it's, it's rare, and they're not long-term participants. They usually swoop in, do something, and, and leave again. Okay, so kind of switch tracks, and I kind of want, this is kind of to explain why I think this is, um, that we're, we're lacking some of these designers. Um, and it's a bit of a personal story, but uh, on July 1st of 2014, uh, my daughter was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Um, and we actually moved in part to Idaho because of that. But diabetes is a autoimmune disease. Uh, type 2 is different. Type 2 is caused by age and uh, oftentimes genetics and also uh, lifestyle. So people will be like, oh, my grandma had diabetes. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's a little bit different. Or actually, it's extremely different, but I, that's great. We can relate on something, I'm sure. Um, but type one, on the other hand, it's an autoimmune disease. It can happen at any stage in life. It used to be called juvenile diabetes because it happened early um, oftentimes, but it doesn't have to. There are people who, women who are pregnant and then afterwards gestational diabetes for some reason turns into type one diabetes and they don't know why. Um, they don't know the cause of this disease. It just kind of happens, but what it does is it shuts down the insulin producing cells in your body. And so once you don't produce insulin anymore, your body cannot use the sugar in your blood. So my daughter at this point in July 1st, her body was eating, was consuming sugar and the sugar was near the cells in the blood, um, but was not able to be utilized by those cells. So my daughter was starving even though she was eating regularly. Um, and then you run into some other issues, but so, yeah, we'll move on quickly, but the, one of the problems is, is that we have the problems with insulin and blood sugar of highs and lows. Your body, if you don't have type 1 or type 2 diabetes, if you get too much insulin and your body uses too much of the sugar, your body will just release some more sugar that it's been storing, so it's not a big deal. With my daughter, for some reason, her body doesn't do that. So she can go either way. She can either go too high for too long, which causes long-term damage, or she can go too low if she gets too much insulin, if she's overdosed, and eventually her body will just kind of shut down. And that one can be very quickly, uh, can happen very quickly, and it's very dangerous. Um, but one of the hard parts about diabetes is, is the lack of data. So six times a day, this was the week after she was diagnosed, six times a day we would have to poke her finger with the needle, um, get the blood out of her finger, put it on a testing strip, and see what her blood sugar was. We would do that before, well, when she first woke up, so before breakfast, before lunch, uh, before dinner, right after dinner or close to bedtime, and then we would do it at two in the morning, right? Um, so it looked like this. This is, I'm giving you a lot more education than you probably expected, huh? This wasn't in the description. Uh, so this is, a, uh, this is the 100, this is milligrams of glucose per deciliter, 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 deciliter of blood. It's a weird measurement because I've never seen a deciliter for blood. We, haven't, we don't need that much of it. But anyway, um, that's, that's the goal line is 100. Uh, anything above 160 is considered high. Anything below 70 is considered low. Um, so this is actually da uh, real data from that, that day where I was holding her in that picture. Um, the problem with it is those were the only points that we have. Um, and so you might expect it was doing something like this in between. Um, but it could have been doing something like this. It could have been doing something like that. And this one's really dangerous because at two in the morning, it would have looked like she was high and I would have ignored anything else after that, but she could actually have been coming down really quickly 
So just a high number by itself doesn't show any direction or anything like that. Yeah, you guys are smart, you know this. All right, so uh, we just didn't have enough data. So um, they have invented what is uh, called a continuous glucose monitor. Um, it's a little strip that goes into your skin. Um, it doesn't check blood sugar, it checks sugar in the interstitial fluid in your skin, which is similar but not quite the same. Uh, and then it transmits it to a receiver, and you can see there, it get, gets a lot more data, right? Every five minutes, it's got a new data point. Um, but one of the downsides to this is that uh, there's the little receiver on the skin. We get about uh, 20 feet distance, right? I've got to keep that receiver 20 feet away from my daughter, uh, who is 10. Uh, that's not really useful to me when I send her off to school. Her school is a small school. She doesn't have a nurse there who knows anything about diabetes. They don't, yeah, they're learning a lot, which is great. Um, and so it, it's not practical for my wife to like follow behind her 20 feet and be like, all right, she's doing okay. Um, so at OzCon last year, or two years ago, yeah, two years ago now, somebody said, hey, you should check out Night Scout. Um, and Night Scout is a project where a dad realized that there was a USB port on this receiver and that you can get the data, it's designed to get that data off of that receiver. And so the first iteration, what he did is he just had a computer, a laptop that he took with his daughter to, uh, to I think it was daycare, and uh, it was constantly pulling the data off of that receiver and then uploading it to the cloud. Um, it's moved on since then, they now uh, use cell phones. So um, my daughter carries around, she's the only 10 year old I know, whose parents are like, yeah, we're getting you a cell phone. Right. Um, so yeah, it uploads it to the cloud, um, and it's it's really nice. In fact, they've actually added a Pebble Watch app, um, so my wife can check her watch. Uh, the only downside is people think that she like has somewhere to go because she checks it once in a while, and they're like, "Ooh, she's really impatient." And she's like, "No, I'm just making sure my daughter's alive." Um, and they've, they've actually, what was interesting is Dexcom, who makes this receiver, they have to go through all of the FDA stuff um, with all of the health regulations. Um, but this is an open source project. We don't have to do any of that for doing it for ourselves. Um, and so they came out with a new version of the, the transmitter or the receiver that actually uses Bluetooth to communicate to a phone. And they went through all this FDA stuff. And within a day of the developers getting it in their hand, they mimicked the exact same behavior and took full advantage of the, the Bluetooth stuff with the Android phone, which Dexcom still hasn't made an Android app. So it's really interesting. Like within just hours of getting their hands on it, the open source community was wor able to work so much faster uh, than all the other stuff. So, oh, and, and we also have an Apple Watch app because you got to have an Apple Watch app, right? It's actually not as good. It's one of the times where I can say, no, the Pebble is totally way better. Because uh, I, I have to wait like five minutes for it to process the data. Yeah, right there. Oh, see, that's not going to work. All right, so, um, but what I wanted to show is, is the power of open source with this. And more than that is what we found with uh, this project becoming a part of it. This is not something I would have been involved in at all before my daughter was diagnosed. It wasn't something that I would have been like, that's really cool that those people are doing that. Good job, right? And I would have moved on. Uh, suddenly, though, when my daughter was diagnosed, I have a vested interest. And you've got people who you might consider to be soccer moms or less technical people who are forking uh, repos on GitHub, who are deploying uh, Node.js applications on Azure and on Heroku, who are utilizing MongoDB. Um, because they have to set it up themselves, otherwise we have to get the FDA involved. And so people are doing it for themselves. Obviously there's great documentation and they're getting a lot of hand-holding wherever they can, but these people are interested in the outcome of this project and they're heavily involved. Um, and it's because they have a sense of community and they have this motivation. Uh, we don't have that necessarily with uh, designers. Um, we don't necessarily, we haven't created that atmosphere for them yet enough. Where we feel like um, they can feel like they are a part of a community. To be honest, open source can be highly exclusive. That may not feel that way to you if you're a developer involved in open source projects, but if you are ever on the outside of open source, people doing their first pull requests on GitHub, it feels pretty daunting, and it feels like it's a cool kids club that they're not a part of sometimes. Or maybe a really nerdy kids club, I don't know. Um, 
but also they need to have the motivation. They need to have a good reason for contributing. Somebody, at one point with the Open Design Foundation, we were like, hey, we're looking for projects that need design help. And we got this, this flood of projects. And some of them were like, we're checking the health of packets that are being sent across. And I'm like, I'm sorry, you're probably never going to get design help with that. Because a designer's never going to care about that. Um, I can't, you, you might find that one, that one who was like, yeah, I really care about the health of packets across. I don't even know what the project was, to be honest. I couldn't get through the readme. Um, so yeah, we need to, we need to help that motivation, help people to, help designers to feel motivated. Um, what time are we going until? Three o'clock? We're just going to keep going until someone makes me stop? <laughs> 310, all right, we still, we're good. Okay, so what do, we go, what do we do until we get those designers? We're working on that. The Open Design Foundation is working actively to try and help designers see the benefits of participating in open source and recruiting and encouraging and getting people to do those things. Uh, but it's gonna be a slow process. It's gonna take some time. We could use your help. If you wanna get involved in the Open Design Foundation, we'd love to have you. Um, feel free to talk to me afterwards. Uh, but we can't wait for them either. So what do we do until then? We had a lot of developers in here, right? Okay, I am officially deputizing you as designers. You are now officially junior designers. Because code is hard. Why don't you just draw pictures all day? That's way easier to do. Um, and there are some real benefits. If you are a junior designer, uh, you get to use Helvetica and feel condescending about it, right? <laughs> Uh, you get to use words like kerning. You get to say, ah, that kerning seems off there. You don't have to know what it means. That's totally cool. There are a lot of people who talk about kerning. They have no idea what it means. Um, and you are allowed to go on to dribble and get inspired by other people's design work and uh, take it wholesale and do whatever you want with it. Uh, because that's what designers do, just so you know. Uh, I can't really give you a full crash course on how to do design. Uh, we don't have that much time. In fact, even if I had the whole session des dedicated to small aspects of design, we wouldn't have enough time. I do have a couple crash courses. I do have a, a, an interesting deck, and I'll tweet this stuff out. Um, but what this deck, in this, in this deck, what I go through is uh, what is UX design? I go through what is a persona? What is uh, a wireframe? What is a site map or a user flow? Um, how, do we, how do we make prototypes that are usable? Right? Like these are all really important UX things that oftentimes when you don't have a designer there to remind you of how important they are, they get glossed over and then you run into real problems later on in the project. So, um, yeah. If you have any questions again about that, feel free to talk to me and I can, I can help you out. Um, but what I should say, um, there are a few things that you should remember is that design is a skill and if you care about design, and obviously you care somewhat because you're here in the session, um, if you care, you can figure it out. You can grow that skill, um, just like any other skill that you might have. Um, but it is discouraging and it's hard. So you're gonna have to not give up and you're gonna have to keep practicing. Uh, which means you can't be stuck by paralyzing perfectionism. You can't go look on Dribble or wherever else you go to get inspired and be like, I've never made anything good in my life, right? And give up. Um, you have to say, hey, I'm not good enough yet, but I'm gonna keep working through it. Uh, which means you can't ever stay satisfied with your current quality of work. Um, ultimately, you can do it. I really believe that all developers, or anybody, if they care enough about design, can at least make incremental improvements in their own design ability. Or ability to design. Design ability is not a word. Um, does anyone have any questions, or are they, anybody have any problems that you currently are facing with design in your projects? Yeah. Well, I have a question about the, the medium, like if a designer did want to contribute. Okay, like excellent. To, like when you go to GitHub, or it, it, it's, I feel like it's not conducive to like essentially providing, hey, here's a wireframe that might be a better user flow. Right. Because you really need that other developer to be able to talk with it to actually do the implementation of that. That, that is an excellent point. Um, are you a designer or are, we, are you a developer? Designer? UX? Okay, so if you came to a project and you said, hey, how do I actually help out with that? Um, ah, dang, I missed, I lost the history. 
Well, we have a, um, I helped out with a Git, with, sorry, with Jade. They needed a new logo. So we ended up, uh, of course we can't ever find the issue that we wanted. All right, here we go. So it started out with somebody saying, hey, is there an official logo for Jade? Um, so if you're a designer, you don't have to contribute code, but if they're already using Git or GitHub, I would say jump on GitHub and start going through the issues. That's an awesome place to get started with design. Because really what you need to do is start design discussions. Uh, we, we sometimes get in open source projects designers who are like, here's your design, see you later, right? Like that, that's helpful once, but it really doesn't help change anything. Um, so what we really need is people to come in and start discussing things, asking the right questions, the ones that you ask in meetings when the, when the, uh, the decision maker's like, yeah, we don't like that because it's purple and we don't like purple. You're like, all right, let's talk about that a little bit more. So I got that a little bit. Um, I put up some logos for Jade, some ideas, and I did exactly what I told you you shouldn't do. Um, and I just posted it there and said like, yeah, and they were like, please not rabbits, right? Like that was the first I got, response I got. Um, which, because I did such a bad job with, with just posting it there, that's totally a valid response. Um, and so then I started going through, and I said, obviously I made stickers before I got approval, right? Because you gotta make stickers. Um, so I started going through and saying, hey, let's talk about what branding means, and let's talk about comparable projects that have some really fun uh, and, and uh, uh, illustrative, almost, um, brands. Um, that are in the same place. Then somebody else said, hey, they don't like the blend modes that were being used. And I said, hey, look, there's other examples of other people using blend modes. I wasn't trying to just say other people are doing it, we should do it too. But I was at least progressing the conversation. And we started going further with it. Um, and and uh, the project owner was like, hey, I feel like it's too rough, let's make it smoother. And so then when they start asking for too many things, like you just start throwing all the options you can, and then you turn it into an animated GIF, right? <laughs> And it just, it was, a, it was a good conversation. And then it ended up, I ended up posting it on, on Dribbble. And Dribbble has a feature where you can rebound posts. This is the first rebound I ever got. Somebody took my design and the source file that I attached to it. They made a slight change and they posted it back up as a rebound. So that's the final logo that we've gone with. Uh, and there's still more work to do because a logo is not the final project, um, but it's a good start. So anyway, this was an example. If you're a designer and you want to get started, screenshots are awesome in GitHub issues. Like I said, that handles animated GIFs. What more do you need, right? Um, so starting the conversation there. Uh, I would also recommend, uh, I do it all the time, though nobody seems to really care too much, but I, I post all of my design files when I'm working on open source projects. I post it on Pixel Apps. Pixel Apps will allow people to download those files and make changes. Um, it also has version history in it. So it doesn't have everything. I can't even log in right now. Uh, um, it doesn't have everything that GitHub has, but it does have version history. So people can go in and annotate individual parts of a design through the history of it. So it's fun. Pixel Apps was recently acquired by Dropbox. I have no idea what's going to happen to the future of this project because of that. I, I, I like Dropbox, and so I hope everything's going to be okay with whatever happens. Um, but they haven't made any new features since the acquisition, which is pretty normal as well. Any other questions about, yeah? I would, for, I think that's a good point. I think that is something to take into consideration. But I would say, first of all, there are a ton of open source projects that do not have any sort of corporate sponsor at all. So for open source projects, there are a lot of hobbyist open, open sourcers. 
but the majority of those hobbyist open sources or amateur open source, whatever you want to call it, they're not getting paid, but I wouldn't call them amateur either. Some of them are extremely talented. Amateur denotes that they're not. But we don't have enough designers for those projects. So that's the first one. They're not taking anybody's job by doing that. Um, the second one, though, for those projects that do have corporate sponsors, I would say it's just the same as developers. When we have developers who are working on corporate sponsored open source projects, we're not worried about getting so many contributions that those people aren't going to have jobs anymore. Like, that's not a problem that we face. Um, if anything, the more contributions you get, the more important those people's jobs are to be able to, their job changes. They've got to be able to figure out how to work with people making pull requests and how to keep the code clean and a cohesive project while you have so many different people working on it. Uh, and the designer's role would change as well. Ultimately, every project would have a creative director on it. It doesn't have to be a full-time job for that project, but ultimately that's what it should be. It should be able to have people making design contributions and somebody in the role, because you don't want design by committee, so you should have somebody in the role of saying, hey, you know what? That works, this doesn't work. Let me mentor you through this so that we can make it work together and now we have a cohesive design. Some people have told me that open source design can't work because design's not modular like development is. You can have three different people working on three different sides of a project on a development thing, and that design's not that way. I think that's a lie. Uh, I think that you can set up guidelines, uh, design guidelines, and then from there, you have plenty of people that could help fill in those gaps. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't think we have to worry about designers taking away jobs. Uh, by contributing to open source. If we get to that problem, I would love that problem. That would be an awesome problem to have because that means we're getting a ton of contributions. Yeah? It's an uphill climb. I think a lot of it's going to be we can borrow a lot of what the development community has done and apply it to designers. I think it will fit a lot of the times. It can be things like extending invitations where it makes sense in whatever format designers want to. That's the thing. If you're an open source project owner and you're looking for designers to come contribute and somebody comes in and gives you a PSD file, you don't complain, hey, that's not working for what we're doing. You say, thank you very much. In the future, if you'd like to use GitHub, this is how we work, but we appreciate any contribution we can get, right? Like that's how, that's, how we, that's how we welcome new people. We don't just say, hey, you're not doing it the right way and close their pull request. You make comments on it. Um, so same thing with designers. You, you say, thank you for what you're doing. We invite you to continue to participate. And then you do your best to pay them back. And oftentimes that's in recognition. If you've got a Twitter account for your project that you've got a ton of people following, you say, hey, this person designed this. They did a ton of design work. They're huge contributors to the project. We're very grateful. I know who the designer is on the SAS logo because the project did a good job of saying thank you. We really appreciate all the contributions you have made. Please continue to do so. Um, that's what we need. Give them, give them the warm fuzzies. Anybody else? Any, anybody else having any problems with design in their projects? Yeah. Right. Um, but something that we appreciate as devs is, or we think we, we appreciate is that we can use lots of tools. You know, right. And we're constantly changing. But it's design themes that we've encountered are usually locked into Photoshop or Illustrator. There's no, there's really, it's really a, a struggle to try to get them to open up to a new technology. And I don't know if you know better ways, of course, of to create that kind of culture to where they're open to trying new things. I would say back off of them a little bit and see if you can take stuff off their, their plate. Or see if you can hire more designers so they're not feeling so strapped. If you got p designers who are strapped or developers as well, they're not going to try new tools if they're too busy just trying to keep up with their workload. They're not going to be like, oh, that's sweet. Let me try something that takes me 10 times longer to do it in, right? Um, 
That being said, I do, as part of the Open Source Design Foundation, we encourage designers to get involved in coding. Um, at least HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, because the majority of projects that they're going to be involved in probably need that as their format. And the reason that we're encouraging that, not so that they're writing production code, but a prototype written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript is much more useful to a developer than a PSD file. So they're better at communicating that way. Also, if, you, if you're designing in code, even if it's rough, gross code, that's totally cool, you get all the benefits of the of the coder, coder's workflow, right? You get all of the benefits of these tools that developers have built for collaborating. Um, you can also try and push SVG more. It just so happens to be a text-based format. Um, so you get some benefits out of it that way. Uh, though we do have GitHub has just added uh, large file support, um, which is interesting. And again, you've got things like, um, like pixel apps. Uh, but trying to force designers into a specific workflow doesn't usually work out very well. You've got to somehow convince them why that's important or why it's useful. But the same thing happens with developers. You can't be like, hey, developers, you're now using Grunt. And they're like, oh, but Gulp is so much better, right? Like, you're going to get that one guy who keeps introducing a Gulp file. And you're like, stop it, right? Like, we're doing Grunt. Um, so yeah, just something that you've got to, yeah. So I don't want to like, give you a hard time because you work for Adobe. Yeah. It's possible. Uh, if you want to ask your design team to switch to other tools, that's the thing. Is it's not about the, the tooling. The tooling would be nice. If we had open source tooling, it would be nice. I'm going to, I would totally, I'm on board with that. In fact, I would love if Adobe tomorrow said, hey, you know what? We're, we're now using PSDX, right? Like an open file format for PSDs. Like that would be awesome. I'd be totally on board with that. They've got weird licensing stuff that they'd have to sort through, and that's not my department, so can't make that decision. But yeah. Follow up on that. So, do you think there's, as an open source developer, do you think there's anything that we could do to make that more inviting, right? To give those tools that would maybe bring developers more into that world on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. If we, if we, there are some interesting workflows that we could work through. I don't think anyone has successfully done the whole fork merge in the paradigm or in the, in the aspect of design. Like, no one's been able to really figure that one out. Um, so I, I think there's definitely room for disruption right there, like if you want to call it that. Go start a startup, make some t-shirts. But um, yeah, it, we're, we, haven't, we haven't quite solved that yet. But there's a lot of stuff that could be utilized right now. Uh, Photoshop actually has no JS running in it. Um, it's got something called Generator, if you wanted to, that you could go and build extensions for, completely open source. Uh, it's really interesting. Um, and I think we'll see some more functionality coming out. Ah, we're getting recorded. I can't talk about anything. All right. Um, but I would say check out Generator. Generator's awesome. Um, if you've got people who are using Photoshop, I'm not actually a Photoshop user. I'm an Illustrator guy. Uh, I like Sketch. Nothing wrong with Sketch. Um, but I still I feel most at home at Illustrator, uh, personally. But Generator is awesome. So you might find some solutions in there. Yeah? Yeah, like. Yeah, I, I, think, I think we'll start to see some bleed over from there. I think SAS is, is an interesting point where people kind of jump in. Designers who are told about the benefits of preprocessors and specifically SAS are like, this is the greatest thing ever. And, they're like, and it's open source. And they're like, oh, what's that? Right? So they're learning about some of the stuff in, a, in a, an interesting way. But it's useful to them. It's part of their workflow. And that provides the motivation. So they're already excited about doing it. Um, again, if you're developing an application that a designer will never use, it's a tough sell to get them to contribute to it. We have no time. <laughs> so if you have any questions, feel free to come up and talk to me. I don't want to run over on the next person. But thank you so much for coming out. <laughs>